morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yes, so my name's John. Just call me John. If we get to run into each other or something, just say, hey, John, how you doing? All right, I hope I get a chance to meet all of you. All of you are studying business. You want to go into business? Yes, no, maybe so. We're trying to figure it out. How many of you are trying to figure it out still? <laughs> all right, all right, good, good. I do like to start with something funny. So I want to tell you about this one entrepreneur that came into the city, and he was actually a lawyer. So he opened his law practice, and he's doing great business and multi-million dollar law firm. And United Way uh, came to him, and they found out that he had not been giving back to the community. Because when you are an entrepreneur and you're doing well in business, people kind of look for you to give back as well. So United Way gets an appointment with him. They meet with him at his office. And they said, hey, um, we see that you haven't contributed anything to this local community since you've been open and since you've been practicing. He's like, can you, they're like, can you explain this? He's like, well, do you know that I actually have a special needs wife at home and she was in an accident and I've been struggling trying to keep up with her? And they were like, oh, okay, we didn't know, we didn't know. And he said, furthermore, do you know that I have a uh, brother in the community and I have to go and visit him because he's a paraplegic and he needs all my time and attention? And they're like, oh my gosh, we are so sorry. He said, furthermore, I have a parent at home who's suffering from dementia and uh, I have to visit him I have to visit my dad, you know, every so often to kind of take care of him and see how he's doing. And they're like, oh, my gosh. They said, we are so sorry. We're just totally insensitive to you. He's like, yeah, and if I don't give to him, her, or him, what makes you think I'm going to give to United Way? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one thing about entrepreneurship is that you do have an opportunity to give back. And uh, that, I'll talk about that a little later on. So my story, as you just heard, uh, I did grow up in Compton, California uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and it was, you know, everything you've probably heard about the 80s and 90s, it was real. I was there, lost a lot of friends to gang violence and drugs. In fact, one of my friends just got out of federal prison, came over to Chick-fil-A and visited me about six months ago. So uh, my nickname growing up in Compton was John John. So he came out and he's like, man, everybody was asking about you up in there. They were like, how's John John doing? And uh, he spent about 12 years in federal prison. Not state prison, federal prison. This is somebody I knew personally growing up. I would spend all kind of time with him and his sister and their grandparents at their house. But um, there's a lot of situations that happened that I'm just thankful to God that I was able to uh, kind of stay on the right track. I, I was raised by my mother in Compton. My uh, biological father had nothing to do with me growing up. In fact, it was until I was about 17 and went off to college that I actually got to spend some time with my dad. And uh, we had a great relationship kind of going forward until he passed away in 2015. Uh, but me growing up, it was just me and my mom. Uh, she actually wound up uh, remarrying. My stepfather now is, uh, they've been a great couple and he's been a great influential presence in my life for so long. Uh, so they're doing great now, my mom and my stepdad. I love them both. Um, but yeah, growing up, my mother was the first person in our family to graduate college. And growing up in the segregated South in Savannah, Georgia, the only thing that she could really get into was probably nursing or teaching. And she came to this earth wanting to teach. She started teaching Sunday school when she was like 10 years old or something and taught all the way through her teen teenage years. And uh, that's what she did for 50 plus years. She's retired now and she loved, loved, loved teaching. In fact, she taught kindergarten for about 35 of those 50 years. And she, believe it or not, at 78 years old, she still substitute teaches. <laughs> in her city, so she loves teaching. But she always imparted to me that the best way to kind of get yourself up and out of certain situations is to focus on education. So education uh, is kind of key in my family. Uh, we believe deeply in, in the need for education and not taking it for granted. So if you have the opportunity like you are right now to sit in a classroom and be taught by wonderful instructors, take advantage of that as much as you possibly can because it is vital. And it's not something to be taken lightly. Uh, no matter what goes on in your life, if you get it in your head and get it in your heart, nobody can take it away from you. So degrees are something that will always stick with you no matter where you go. And I highly, highly encourage you to focus on your education. Uh, so I applaud you guys for being here. Give yourselves a, plan, a hand. You guys, you're doing the right thing by being at this college campus, in this classroom, learning, studying, taking tests. Uh, trying to better yourselves because um, with education, like I said, nobody can take that away from you. It's not going to be some government subsidy or somebody giving you anything. You are taking 
a proactive approach to your life and your life choices. So by being here, it, it is, it's very, very critical, and I, and I do applaud you guys. So congratulations to yourselves. Um, so yeah, I went through uh, school. Even though my mother taught in Compton Unified School District, uh, she just believed in putting me in private school, believe it or not. She's like, education is key. I'm going to make sure you get a good education. As a single parent on a teacher's salary from Compton Unified, uh, she kept me in private school, and I was so great. I'm, to this day, I'm so grateful to God for that because I got a top-notch education, and I'm very, very thankful for the position that that put me in. Uh, when I finished high school, I was student body president, valedictorian of my class, and um, I had a lot of opportunities before me. But what, what, what I was really passionate about from yay high up to my junior year in uh, high school was flying, aviation. So I was that kid that always looked up at the sky every time a plane flies over. Even now, I'll look at the sky and watch airplanes. Uh, I would build airplanes out of Legos, and everything in my house was all about aviation when I was a kid. So that was, that's what was in my heart to do. So I, my junior year, I walked into my counselor's office at high school, and I said, Ms. Carter, I said, where can I go to learn how to fly airplanes for a degree? Because I knew there wasn't much that I was really interested in, and I knew I didn't want to just do kind of what everybody else was doing. And I knew what was in my heart to do. So she went, at the time, we didn't have like the internet and all that stuff. So she goes over to her file cabinet. How many of you know what a file cabinet is? Because <laughs> I know we keep a lot of stuff on computers now. But she goes into her filing cabinet, and she pulls out a catalog. These, this is the back in the day where catalogs were sent by every major college. And you got to see everything about the university and classes they offer. She pulls out a catalog, and it's to this one school called Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And she's like, every pilot I know has gone to this school. Here, take this catalog. So I read that catalog from front to back. It was like 150 pages, just learning about the school. I had never heard of this school. Of course, as a kid growing up in Compton, you're like, where do you go to fly airplanes? So she gave me the catalog. That's the one school I applied to. The Air Force Academy was taking a hard look at me. And uh, once I saw a video of what the Air Force Academy was like in Colorado Springs, I was like, uh, I'm too laid back for that. That's not me. So the Air Force recruiter at the time said, well, if you don't want to do the Air Force Academy, you can get an ROTC scholarship, and you can go to any college of your choice, and we'll pay for it. I said, you got to be joking me. <laughs> get out of here. So I applied for the ROTC scholarship, applied to get in Embry-Riddle, and kind of the rest is history. So 17 years old, I left um, home moved 3,000 miles away to Daytona Beach, didn't know a soul down there, 17 years old, this is what I wanted to do, and my degree is actually in commercial aviation, or what we call at Embry-Riddle aeronautical science. So part of my day was spent on the flight line, the other part was spent in classrooms just like this, learning about aerodynamics and the uh, concepts of flight, uh, flight safety, aerospace physiology, and things like that. So I spent four years down there at Embry-Riddle in Daytona Beach, Lots of great times at spring break. Everything you've heard about spring break in Florida is true. I got to live through it. A lot of colleges come down to Florida every February through April, and they spend a lot of money and party a lot. So that, that is true. <laughs> um, and then after those four years, I got a chance to um, complete my degree, uh, go into the Air Force as a second lieutenant, which is an officer. Uh, when you come into the military as an officer, you immediately outrank about 80% of the armed forces. So completing my degree and ROTC gave me the opportunity to be an officer in the military. Um, after that, I was kind of a little bummed because there weren't any pilot slots in the mid-90s when I graduated. And that's what kind of everybody wants to do. They want to get this amazing pilot training opportunity uh, when they enter the Air Force. And there just weren't any to go around in the mid-90s. The Gulf War had just ended. There were a lot of cutbacks. So what I wound up doing was going to Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is right up here on the Central Coast, and I launched satellites into orbit. I did that for about three years and waited for my uh, pilot training slot to open up. So um, believe it or not, yeah, launch controlling, putting satellites on top of the rockets, sending them into orbit. A lot of times you see uh, weather depictions on the Weather Channel on your local news. That was because of satellites that I had a chance to uh, launch from Vandenberg. It was pretty cool. It wasn't what I wanted to do, but it was really cool. So we launched weather satellites, spy satellites, some of those things I can talk about, some I can't, but that's really uh, another interesting career field that you can do in the military. So 
This whole idea of Space Force, if any of you guys have heard about that, it's real. I still have friends that are in the military in Space Command, and they work at the Pentagon now, and yeah, space is really taking off. So got done with Vandenberg, got a chance to go into pilot training, and um, I went to pilot training in Columbus, Mississippi with the Air Force. And uh, the one plane I wanted to fly was a C-130. If I should have brought a picture of a C-130. Some of you may know what that looks like, some may not but it's a large, heavy transport airplane, and it's about 250,000 pounds in takeoff. It's kind of the equivalent of a 737. You guys know Southwest Airlines? They fly 737s. Uh, the plane I flew in the military is about that same size. So we were responsible for taking uh, paratroopers. If you've ever seen Army paratroopers jump out the back of a C-130, um, that's, the, that's what I did pretty much on a regular basis. Uh, we would fly the president's limousines wherever President Bush was going because he has to have transportation. Um, gosh, what else? Artillery, food. And the main reason I got into the C-130 that I was passionate about was because they were primarily used for humanitarian missions. So I didn't want to just do something to kind of serve myself. I wanted to make sure that I was in an opportunity to serve others. So C-130s are used to take um, food and water into war-torn countries, or after a, a hurricane or some type of earthquake, you'll see C-130s loading up and taking whatever needs uh, the people have. So that's what the C-130 is used for as well, for those humanitarian missions. So the afternoon of September 11th, I'm in my flying squadron in Nashville, and uh, of course, some of you were probably about that age where you were maybe a toddler when that happened on September 11th. Uh, I'm in my flying squadron. I was like 26, 27 at the time. And we're just watching this, this catastrophe happen. And we get a call from Tennessee Donor Services. So they're responsible for matching donor uh, organs with donor recipients. So there was like a six month old baby that died in Nashville at Vanderbilt Hospital. And the parents had donated the organs. So Tennessee Donor Services had this all planned out for Tuesday, September 11th. We were gonna take this dying baby's liver that morning, put it on a chartered flight, take it to Houston, because there's a baby in Houston named Karina that needs that liver. So things are going as well, the surgery went well, the, the baby unfortunately passed away, but this liver is now in a um, styrofoam cooler on ice with the eight hour hold time. And once they put that, liver on ice, they found out about the Twin Towers uh, coming down in New York and the uh, attacks on the Pentagon. And the chartered flight that they had planned to use that Tuesday could no longer take off. All the flights were grounded. Uh, the word came out from, from uh, the Pentagon and the, and the White House that no planes were going to take off that day. Um, all flights were to be grounded. We had crews in my squadron that were overseas. We had some in Europe. We had some in Hawaii. So they were stuck there for like a week because nobody could come in or leave the country. So you can imagine when we get a call from Tennessee Donor Services that, hey, we got a baby's liver. Can y'all take it to Houston? And we're looking at each other like, wow, um, sure. <laughs> That's what we get paid to do. So we get on the phone with everybody at the Pentagon that we need to talk to to get a flight plan cleared. Uh, I remember talking to the Department of Defense. Um, there was the FAA, of course, was involved with approving this flight plan. They finally approved the, pl the flight plan that day around 12 o'clock. Uh, we had already kind of loaded up in anticipation that they would approve this. We had security forces in the back. That's basically police officers with guns because uh, we didn't know what else was out there. We didn't know if we were going to get shot down. We had no idea what to expect, but we knew that there was a baby in Houston that needed that liver. So me and another pilot, his name was Chuck Eccles, uh, we got our crew together and we flew that afternoon as we we're watching planes land. After everyone had landed, we we're on the runway taxiing out for takeoff. And we took off out of Nashville about 12 o'clock, got to Houston about 2 p.m., left the engines running. We did what we call a uh, engine running offload. Uh, they came, the paramedics came and secured the liver took it off our airplane. We didn't even shut the engines down. We just let them come in and get it. We taxied back out and flew back to Nashville uneventful, thank God. Uh, that experience really caused me to want to kind of reevaluate my life and determine, because at that point, I just wanted to 
you know, fly airplanes. And I said, I'm going to be a pilot for Delta one day and live in Atlanta, Georgia. That was always my dream. But that experience caused me to think like, wow, maybe I can use my, my talents and my gifts for other people. And it doesn't have to be all about me. So uh, it was really laid on my heart after much uh, prayer and, and just taking time to think about this, what I could do. And the one thing that kept pressing on me over and over and over again was Chick-fil-A. And the reason I got into Chick-fil-A was because I really wanted to be a help and a blessing to people. And through Chick-fil-A, I've had the opportunity to do that. So I've had myriad chances to help people that work for me, people that visit my restaurant, people in the community that probably would never eat Chick-fil-A. Uh, I get a chance to do that on a daily basis. So this is in essence what I want to talk to you about is once you find your passion, you will never feel like you're working ever a day in your life. Uh, I'm passionate about people. I'm passionate about making sure that they are living the best life possible. Uh, for me, my personal objective in life is to help lead people into a better way of life for themselves and for others. So that's my personal objective, and I get to live that out every day through what I do with my business. Um, I've had several people that have worked for me that never thought they could do anything in life. Uh, I've hired 14-year-olds, I've hired 50-year-olds plus, and giving them something that they can just gravitate to and embrace, uh, a mission that's bigger than themselves has been really rewarding for them and equally as rewarding for me. Uh, so I've had some team members that work for me. Right now I employ about 85 people in my one restaurant at Chick-fil-A Long Beach Town Center. Um, I've been open since April, I opened April 20th, believe it or not, 2006, and it'll be 13 years come April. But what I do on a daily basis is bigger than just selling chicken sandwiches. Um, like I said, I get to influence a lot of people behind the counter and the customers that come to visit. Uh, I've had team members that wanted to get pregnant, I mean, wanted to get married, excuse me, and subsequently pregnant at uh, like 15, 16, 17 years old. I've had a chance to talk to them, mentor them, and just kind of change their perspective and just say, hey, you know, time out for that. That's going to come. Focus on your career. Focus on your education. Uh, do a lot of things that you enjoy doing right now and, and then press ahead. Um, a lot of my team members have gotten scholarships for college. That's just because uh, Chick-fil-A offers it with partnership from people like me. I get to know them. I type up a whole bunch of stuff about them that makes them look like they can walk on water <laughs> in a lot of cases. And they've gotten $2,500 scholarships for college just be, because they're team members with, with me. And the opportunities I've had to give back in the community. Uh, some stuff you would read about in social media or in the news, some stuff you don't. People don't know that I get a chance to give food away to homeless shelters. Uh, there's a charity in Long Beach uh, that's called Precious Lamb, and they are specifically open as a faith-based charity to take in homeless children, children of families that don't have anywhere to live. So they come there for daycare during the day. Uh, I get a chance to donate lunch to those kids on a regular basis. Uh, currently, I'm, the, I'm serving this year as the chairman of the board for our Chamber of Commerce in Long Beach. So our chamber in Long Beach has about 800 members, just business members, collectively for the city. And this year, I have the opportunity to serve as chairman of the board of directors. So that's another opportunity I've had to really be influential in what I do. So for me, this is my DNA. I love... I love working, I love being able to influence, I love using my gifts and talents to run a, a A-plus business in quality. Um, my customers love it as well. I mean, the focus on keeping clean, keeping food safe, which is huge. You guys have heard some devastating stories about food safety in the news. I'm not going to name any brands, but there are some out there that don't take food safety seriously. Um, so it's been a challenge that I enjoy. We're going to figure out how to make sure we keep our cold, fo cold food cold and our hot food hot. And we're going to do it and it's going to be in a fun, invigorating way. So we don't want to get people sick. We don't want to have a massive outbreak. But this is what we do on a regular basis. And my team loves it. I have a leadership team of about 12 people that help me run the business day in and day out. So my first people show up at like 5 o'clock and they're washing produce, they're chopping produce, all our salads and wraps we build by hand at Chick-fil-A. 
And um, the last people leave around 11 or midnight every night, except for Sunday. If you don't know Chick-fil-A, <laughs> we're closed on Sundays. But uh, it's been a great ride. It's been awesome. Uh, if it wasn't, it's crazy to think, if it wasn't for 9-11, I probably wouldn't even have time to sit and think about what I really would want to do with my life. Uh, airline piloting is cool. Flying airplanes is awesome. But the opportunity to give back as my regular day job is awesome. Um, that's how I get a chance to come and spend time with students like yourselves. This is part of what my personal mission in life is to do. And who knows what the future holds, but I certainly want to continue doing what I do, and it doesn't feel like work. So the one thing I would challenge you on is really, as you are studying business and trying to figure out what you want to do, really get to know yourself and say, what would make me happy? If money was not an issue, what would I do with my life? And that's something to think about. If I could do anything in this world, make it happen, not thinking about money, but what is the one thing I'm truly, truly passionate about? And one way to determine what you're truly passionate about is to ask yourself, what infuriates you? What do you see in the world that just drives you bonkers that you're like, oh, I wish I could. I wish somebody would correct that. Well, that somebody is probably you. If it gets you that upset to the point where you're like, somebody needs to do something, that's probably a good indication of what you're passionate about. Really good indication. And I would start there. I would start there and really know that your contributions, everyone's been gifted with talents and desires and passion. Uh, I just encourage you to use that to help better your local community, your country, and this world, and really ask yourself, man, what can I do to contribute to make this a better place? And I know for a fact, through my um, experiences at Chick-fil-A, I've done that, and I'm continuing to do that, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, it's just been, it's been awesome. So I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna let you all answer, uh, ask some questions, and I hopefully will give you some answers. <laughs> as best as I can. So, anyone? Yes, sir. Well, since we have a lot of business students here, it's kind of good for them to hear and, and what, what are um, the focus in, in, in this school through the business instructors and what I've learned and, and you guys have emphasized is the simple concept is the, is the customer is always right. And I know you can speak to that because Chick-fil-A is all about So your question is, is the customer always right? Exactly. <laughs> That's your question? Yeah. What, for you guys, it's for you to emphasize mm -hmm. what that means. Yeah. Um, I've, yeah, we've talked about this quite extensively in my business. So the perception needs to be that the customer is always right. Now, I will tell you this. In business, it does require tact. Uh, who can tell me what tact is? Strategy or strategy is kind of, yeah, in that ballpark. Tact is basically the ability to say something or do something without overly offending the other person. So I might tell you, like, what's your name? Albert. Albert? I'm going to say, Albert, man, you suck. Or I could tell you, you know what, Albert, let's think about doing this a different way. And that's a lot of the times that we have to... A lot of things we do at Chick-fil-A requires a lot of tact. Um, if a customer is just kind of over the top and we know they're in the wrong, when somebody orders eight nuggets and they bring back one and they say these nuggets weren't good, you're like, wow, really? I could, I could tell that customer, like, you know, you are so full of <laughs> But I don't do that. I don't do that. What we uh, try to do is to say, oh, ma'am, you know, ma'am, sir, we are so sorry about that. Can you explain, like, what was wrong with them? And they'll tell us, and we'll just gladly replace the nuggets. Because nuggets cost me probably 74 cents. 74 cents that I'm probably just going to give away to a customer. Now, the customer's paying $5 for it, but an eight-count box of nuggets cost me 74 cents. So at the end of the day, is it worth 74 cents to lose a customer, ruin your perception, ruin your reputation? over 74 cents. Yeah, so you have to be tactful in business. And I will add this to a lot of things in business because with my aviation degree, I had to take, I think, one business course 
and I had to take an economics course as part of my degree, which I kind of jokingly said this earlier, I kind of slept through in college because I was so in interested in flying airplanes. I said, I never go into business. My best friend was all about business. He went to LMU and he got his MBA and I was like, man, I'm going to make money in the air. He was like, no, you got to get into business. I was not interested in business at 17, 18, 19, year, 19 years old. But what I will tell you is that as I started learning more about business, I learned that a lot of business requires common sense. So the, even the situation I just explained to you right now kind of boils down to common sense. You can go back and forth with the guests all you want, but it's not wise to do that, like I said, for those reasons that you would lose a customer over. So a lot of what you see in business is truly common sense. That's good news to some of you. It may not be good news to some others, but to me that's good news because I don't have like the MBA, I don't have a lot of business background, but what I do have is a good heart to serve and I have good common sense, so yeah. What else? Yes, ma'am. And it come up in some of the other sessions as well. So when you're hiring employees, mm -hmm. what do you look for to make sure they make that right decision and know? Good. Question is when I hire employees or what we call team members, um, what do we look for? So the first and foremost, what we look for is what I personally look for, and I encourage my, my leaders to look for, are to hire things that we cannot train. What do I mean by that? Great attitudes, great personalities, great smiles. I don't care if you've got a PhD in physics and you have a poor attitude, you cannot be on my team. I would much rather work with somebody who has a great attitude and less skill than the other way around where they've got all of this skill but a poor attitude. So I can tell from somebody off the bat, and most of my team members can tell if they come in presenting themselves with a good aura, uh, if they have a great attitude, if it's easy for them to smile. One thing I look for is that do people smile when they talk? And if they smile when they talk, they're probably gonna smile when they come to work and work behind the counter or stand in my drive-through. So there's one young lady we hired, her name's Bailey, she just like has this smile planted on her face. I mean, it's every time I see her, she's just, hi, John, how are you? What can I get for you? And those are the types of people that we like to see, people with great attitudes. So when you see uh, team members at Chick-fil-A, most Chick-fil-A's, um, it's that they weren't really trained to do that, but we actually sought after people that had that as a natural given instinct. So that's first and foremost is attitude, personality, and that type of chemistry. And then secondly, uh, how well you present yourself in an interview. Uh, believe it or not, when you get out of a car, if they can see you, there are windows in the building where you're approaching for an interview, they're probably watching you either through the window or on camera or something. Um, my wife often tells a story of how she would interview people in her career field and she would go straight to the receptionist after the interview and say, how did this person treat you? Because you should be treating the CEO the same way you treat the people that clean the restrooms and, and answer phones at the end of the day. So uh, my hope and my prayer is that everyone that comes to work knows how to treat people. And we can determine that through interviews and you being evaluated as soon as you walk into the building. Yeah. Yes, sir. What was this starting point in business for you? What's that? What was this starting point in business for you? The starting point? So for me, it was researching the Chick-fil-A opportunity. I looked at some other franchises, but Chick-fil-A was the one I looked at because I liked, this, I liked the service and the food. I love the people, and I love their business concept of being closed on Sundays. So the starting point for me was, believe it or not, in 2003 when I applied, we actually had the internet back in 2003. So I uh, went online and I looked up as much as I could printed out, at the time you could print out an application from the Chick-fil-A website and they wanted it handwritten. So I did that, I did that. And to become a Chick-fil-A operator, that's what we call our franchisees, owner operators. To become a Chick-fil-A franchisee, it takes about 12 to 18 months to get, to, to get selected. And they get about 40,000 applications a year right now and they select maybe 100 people out of that. So our CEO always jokes that it's harder to get into CFA than it is a CIA because it's a lot of rigorous stuff you got to go through, uh, which was fine for me because um, I didn't really have anything to hide and I just loved what I wanted to do. I knew what I wanted to do and 
was going to press ahead in that. So that was it. That was it. The initial research was on me. And through that experience, I just called up random people that own Chick-fil-A's. I didn't know these people from Adam. And I just said, hey, my name's John. I'm going to be applying for a Chick-fil-A opportunity. Is there a way that I can come and meet with you? And thank God that everybody that I spoke with was more than willing to open up their doors and set some time for me on the schedule to do that, which is a practice I put in play every year that I've been open in business. People that want to be operators, uh, I spend time with them and I let them come in and see how we do what we do and work. In fact, one of my recent um, selectees at Chick-fil-A, he's going to open up a uh, Chick-fil-A in Norwalk here in November. So he's a guy that um, I knew from previous years, but I got a chance to kind of mentor him through the process and work with him. So I'm super excited for him to open up in November at Norwalk. Yes. Yes, sir. How much uh, research and how long did it take you to do your research to open your Wow. The research, how long did it take to do research and to open up? The research involved a lot of kind of ground pounding, just getting out there, meeting people. Uh, on days, I was still in the Air Force when I applied in 2003, so on days that I was not flying, which was probably two to three days a week, I was going into my local Chick-fil-A, A, for free, and B, uh, just to do it just because I wanted to learn the business. I was so hungry to learn about this opportunity uh, called Chick-fil-A franchising that I spent my own personal time, energy, and resources going in and just meeting people and learning how they do business and learning from those operators, what does it take to run a good quality business? So there's, I was in Nashville at the time, like I mentioned with the 9-11 story. Uh, I was in Nashville, so I got to know quite a few of the Nashville operators because I was literally just going in cold turkey. I was working with 17 and 18 year olds making at the time like seven bucks an hour. So here's this Air Force pilot coming in to sling chicken. <laughs> <laughs> at lunchtime and I was right next to them just learning why they do what they do and how they do it and then sometimes I was available on Saturday nights I would go close a restaurant with them just to learn as much as I could so uh, one thing that I failed to mention is that hard work hard work will propel you to the next level if you don't want to work hard it's gonna be really hard to succeed I love work it's not the main thing but I don't mind working and I, I guess just because I, I, I never was like the lazy type, I just always believed that hard work would certainly pay off. And it has through all through my education, all through the Air Force. Uh, I will tell you a funny story. When I came to the point where I was ready to get out of the Air Force to go do the Chick-fil-A thing, the wing commander, the guy who was in charge of the base, his name was Colonel Harris. He was the top dog, what we call the wing king, the wing commander. I go into Colonel Harris and I say, Colonel Harris, I'm looking at pursuing this Chick-fil-A opportunity. And he's like, really? And at the time, I was the sec. This squadron that I flew in in Nashville was about 80 years old. And we have a, a very specified mission in that squadron. And I was the second black pilot in that squadron's history. So I go in to talk to Colonel Harris. And Colonel Harris looks at me. He's like, man, he said, I have so much hope for you. I hope that you can be sitting in this chair one day. And you are the, just the epitome of breaking glass ceilings. And he said, but what I want for you is what you want for yourself. And he said, I completely support you in this. And if that's what you want to do, I'll, I'll support you and give you whatever you need. So a lot of my flying buddies, they were like, hey, John, I hear you're going to turn in your flying wings for chicken wings. And, <laughs> and uh, that's always stuck with me. But I knew that I had to do something else. And I mean, I wasn't just like getting kicked out of the Air Force. I, it was nothing like that. It was purely just my decision to walk away. And um, it was hard. It was hard because, A, I was good at it. I had been flying airplanes since I was 17. And special missions that came up, like the 9-11 mission, they knew that they could trust me to fly these missions. And anytime we had guests come in that, that wanted to fly with us, they would pick me to go and fly with special guests. I was really good at flying. and. I loved it. I loved it. But I knew there was something bigger and better inside of me that I could use my talents and skills for. Yes, ma'am. You seem like you're at a good point in your life. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what you're planning to do in the next five or ten years as far as your business and personal growth. Interesting you say that. Um, we have what's called at Chick-fil-A a business consultant. 
So that's kind of the liaison, liaison between me and the Chick-fil-A corporate office. And my business consultant actually just visited last week and asked me that same question. He's like, what do you want to do? He's like, man, you've had the great success here. Can you see doing something else? Can you see opening up another restaurant or moving to a better opportunity? And I said, okay, you know what? Maybe, maybe. So I would like to expand with Chick-fil-A. I would like to mainly expand the influence that I have and be able to um, impact more people. So I'm really trying to just kind of settle down, get quiet and figure out how I'm going to do that. What would, best, what would be the best method to do that? Uh, as many of you know, Chick-fil-A's are kind of popping up everywhere. Uh, they see California as the new frontier, and there's quite a few Chick-fil-A's now. I think we've got 120 in the state, and they want to do probably 400 to 450 in the state. So if any of you are interested in a Chick-fil-A opportunity, you need to start researching it now. I would highly encourage you to do that. But uh, yeah, there's some, that's something I would like to do kind of going forward. Um, yeah, I love what I do, and that's where I would see myself in the next five or 10 years. Yeah, either with a second location or maybe a different one. Yes, sir. Uh, what are the qualities of a great leader? Qualities of a great leader, interesting. Uh, one of my um, military instructors, he taught from the 14 traits of a leader. You can probably Google that. The Army has their version of it. The Navy has their version of it. The Air Force has their version of it. 14 traits of a leader. Um, that involves loyalty, that involves tact, that involves courage. There's so many traits of a leader. One thing that's been beneficial to me is the ability to do for others what I would want done to myself, which is basically the golden rule. Have you guys heard of the golden rule? It's just, yeah, treat others the way you want to be treated. So that's one thing I've really employed in my business. And it's paid really well for me just because I've got to foster some great relationships. And when people mess up, I tell them it's not the end of the world. My team will tell you, I always say, the plane's not going to crash if you make a mistake. Uh, I've seen some bad leaders through my Air Force career, and I said, I don't want to be like that. But for me, first and foremost, I, first and foremost, I want to treat people the way I want to be treated. So sometimes that requires tact. It doesn't require you always yelling and kicking and screaming when somebody messes up but really trying to go to the person and understand like why you did what you did. And you know, let's talk about that and let's make sure that doesn't happen again. So one thing I tell my team at Chick-fil-A is if you're not making mistakes, you're not growing. So I expect you to make mistakes, which is contrary to what a lot of business leaders will tell you. And you kind of have to put on this facade like I'm not going to mess up. I'm not going to screw up. I want you to learn. I want you to apply what you've learned in training. But at the end of the day, it's OK if you make a mistake. It's not the end of the world. 99.9% .9 of the time, things will continue if you make a mistake. Now, the problem will come in if you keep making the same mistakes over and over again. Then we're going to have some issues. And at that point, I probably have to help you find other employment and uh, kind of pursue a different way of life. But. Uh, when there's opportunities to be recognized, I look at somebody and I say, man, if that were me, how would I want to be recognized? Or if somebody messes up, how would I want to be criticized? Would I want to be criticized in front of a room of people? Or would I want somebody to bring me to the side and talk to me uh, as a friend and a concerned partner? So that's, that's probably my favorite trait of leadership is treating people the way you want to be treated. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah, so he's asking what are some everyday habits to implement in your daily life. Uh, because I have a military background and I had a really strict mother growing up, I have a lot of discipline. Uh, I think discipline gets overlooked quite a bit in today's society, but discipline requires you to do things whether you feel like it or not. And if there's something that needs to be done, whether you say I'm tired, whether you say uh, you know what, this week has been horrible, I don't feel like it. Discipline will kick your butt and say, get up and do it regardless. Uh, like for example, the biggest, we have flight evaluations in Air Force pilot training and 
The Air Force, Air Force spends about $3 million for a 52-week training program to train its pilots. So when I went through that program, there was 25 people in my class and the government spending about $3, $3 million per person to train these pilots. And the biggest evaluation I had in Air Force pilot training required me to pretty much stay up a long time to prepare for this flight evaluation. And I literally went to sleep at about three o'clock the night before and got up at six to go fly this mission, which I would never recommend on a regular flying day. Uh, don't go into a, an, an issue or a mission like that, but I knew how much weight this carried and I wanted to get everything done and be prepared for what I had to do. So I said all that to say this, that I felt like just crashing out and saying I'll wing it and go about, you know, I'll fly how, however I can do it to the best of my ability tomorrow, but I, I wanted to be prepared. So I stayed up super late, got it done, and I got the highest grade out of anybody in my class. But that's where discipline kicks in and says, you know what, do what you gotta do, do what you gotta do. And I was a distinguished graduate of my Air Force pilot training class. Uh, in business, it requires me, I get up early, I'm an early riser. So me personally, and uh, you know, I'm gonna talk about faith a little bit, my faith. So uh, for me, it requires getting up and spending time with God each and every uh, morning. I get up early because there's no distractions. Um, it's still pretty dark, it's quiet, my phone's not going off, my wife and daughter are asleep, so I like to get up and do that. I also like to get up and go to the gym early in the mornings because it's not as crowded, and by the time six or seven o'clock rolls around, I'm pretty much ready to start my day with the outside world. And that is because of empl employing discipline in my life. Um, also with reading and studying, I think uh, you require a certain amount of discipline. Um, so I would try to get into some good habits of kind of looking at your end result, like what is my end result? Do I want to graduate at this date? And what's it going to take for me to graduate at this date? Because after you graduate, I mean, I want to say you can coast. You can probably coast a little bit, but then, you know, jobs and careers kick in. But really try to employ more discipline in your life. That would really help. Yes, sir. Ooh, yes, yes, and yes, all of the above. Uh, he asked, for, if you didn't hear him, would you say that I got this far by networking or bettering myself? And I'm here to tell you that my life is not just me by myself. Uh, there's people that I grew up, especially in my city of Compton, uh, older people that just poured into me that were like, John, John, you can do this, you can be different. Uh, when they found out I got good grades on my report card, they're slipping me $20 bills and just saying, go, go, go. And, you know, even uh, some of the gangbangers <laughs> that I know growing up, like, hey, man, you need to go to school. Don't get caught up in this life. You know, here, here, just go, pushing me. So it's not just me. And then my grandparents, my mother, uh, my grandmother grew up on a sharecropper's farm. And if you don't know what sharecropping is, it's, it's kind of like uh, at the turn of the a century after the Civil War, um, Blacks were allowed to live on a farm for free if they worked to kind of tend the land and things like that. So my grandmother grew up on a sharecropper's farm in South Carolina. And I mean, her and all her siblings, there was nine of them. They were always pushing me to just do the better, do the better thing. So uh, I'm just standing on the shoulders of people who went before me. And I hope that my children will one day, you know, go and, and farther than I ever could have dreamt. My five-year-old wants to be an astronaut, which is amazing because I wanted to be an astronaut as a kid. And of course, I didn't get to do that, but my hope is that she could go on and press ahead. Uh, networking is also important. Um, everything that I, not everything, but a lot of things you see in my current business, I actually have learned and picked up from others. So what you don't want to do is reinvent the wheel. And like this morning, we had some of our floor drains, I don't know if you've been in a commercial kitchen, but there are floor drains, so when water and grease is kind of washed up, it goes right into the floor drains uh, around the kitchen, and some of those drain covers actually cracked. And I knew another owner that had replaced those with some high-tech, pretty fancy floor drains, so I reached out to him this morning at like 7.30, and I said, hey, buddy, where did you get those floor drains? And he sent me a link, but that's part of networking. So I didn't have to go and sit in front of a computer or have one of my managers sit in front of a computer for an hour to try to research how to get new floor drains. 
Uh, it's just that networking that helps. So, and people have come to me asking how I do what I do, and it's, it's, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. So a little bit of both. Uh, let me take her in the back. Yes, ma'am. What is the financial advice for starting a franchise? Uh, first and foremost, foremost, live within your means. That's huge. That's huge. If, um, I mean, okay, let's just say hypothetically all of you are living on your own. I know there are some people in here that probably live with their parents or other family members. But if you're living on your own and you're making $2,000 a month, live within your means until your financial situation improves. Uh, don't try to go out and take out a bunch of credit cards, a bunch of loans to buy some temporary stuff. Uh, and a lot of times people will get things and buy things to impress people that they don't even like and people that don't like them. So yeah, you can walk around with this nice new purse or this nice new car, but for what? Um, I still have like my 2004 <laughs> SUV, my Infiniti SUV is paid for. It's got like 250,000 miles on it. Um, and I also, was, I also won a new car from Chick-fil-A. So I haven't paid for a car in years. I won a car through a contest at Chick-fil-A uh, in 2017. But I said all that to say, if you can just live within your means, uh, only buy stuff when you can buy it straight out with cash, uh, you'll be in a better financial position to get what you need in order to um, have the opportunity to get something better. So. Again, if you're making, like I said, $2,000 a month and you have the opportunity to open up a business that could bring you much more cash flow or buy a piece of real estate that could bring you much more cash flow, put yourself in that position. And that also goes back to not working. Uh, one book I read that I just love that changed my whole perspective was Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. And he always talked to, in that book, the theme is go do businesses that don't necessarily, necessarily require your presence that are gonna bring you these different streams of income. Real estate, uh, whatever business doesn't require you to be there, uh, that's gonna put you in a better financial position. But you have to start now by not taking out what I call dumb debt, credit cards and loans, just to pay for stuff. I mean, uh, education, that's an appreciating asset. Like if you're taking out a loan to go to school, I mean, there, there are better ways that you could probably do that, but it's not the end of the world to take out a loan to go to school because that's gonna support you going forward. So I am somewhat in favor of that, um, but just keeping yourselves in great financial positions right now will help you, will help you. And I was one of those kids in college that took out dumb debt, credit cards, and I was like, oh my gosh, when I got into the Air Force, I had to start paying all that stuff back because in Daytona Beach, they were like, here, sign up for this credit card, get this T-shirt. Sure, why not? But looking back, that was the dumbest thing I could have ever done. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, how does your being an owner-operator affect your home life? Like, affect my home life? Yeah, like being able to look down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually best um, for me because I have a chance to kind of dictate my schedule and if something's coming up with the family, I determine if I'm gonna be there or not. So it's not like I gotta put in and say, hey boss, can I get this day off? Or can I take this afternoon off? Um, like my daughter has swim lessons every Tuesday at 3.30. Hey John, are you gonna give yourself that time off? Sure John, go on and take it off. <laughs> I mean, it's just the coolest thing. So um, my home life is, is definitely enhanced because I'm a business owner. And a lot of people let the business run their lives and they're 100% consumed by the business. I don't do that. I just kind of put things in perspective and I realize that there's a time and place for everything. That's one thing my mother always taught, like there's a time and a place to do everything. And some days I have to grind and spend time on the business and other days I don't. And like days like today, the middle of the week, Wednesday, I'd much rather be here with you. I can set that aside in my schedule to be here with you all uh, versus having to be at a job somewhere and not having this opportunity. So I think that's probably one of the best things I like about business is the quality of life. And I got to experience that while I was flying airplanes too. So uh, for some people, quality of life means so much. And I'm one of those people. For some of you, you know, it's all about the dollar. You want to make as much money as possible. But I will advise you on this, don't spend 
like your years when you're healthy, trying to gain wealth, and then when you get older and you're not so healthy, then you have to spend your wealth trying to get healthy. Does that make sense? Yeah, so just try to keep it all in balance. I mean, I work hard, but I also like to play hard. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, and I did touch on that a little earlier. My mother raised me in Compton. Um, since my mother was a kindergarten teacher, she would pick me up from like my, my daycare, which used to be called Playpen on Alondra Boulevard. It's not there anymore, but at two and three years old, she was going over her kindergarten lessons with me. So by the time I got to preschool, they were like, man, this kid can start school early, and that's why I wound up starting school early. But my home life was great. And Compton in the 70s was different than what you saw like in the late 80s and 90s. So I remember just being on my bike, the whole neighborhood. We knew everybody on my block. I always say heaven's going to be like 1978 Compton. <laughs> I mean, it was just awesome. Just all the kids outside playing football. No, no concern for anything that was unsafe. Of course, when the street lights came on, you better have your butt in the house. But everybody on the streets, were, it was just awesome. It was awesome. So uh, my mother kept, us, kept me in church and kept me in the books. And I had a fabulous childhood, fabulous childhood. But there were also those influences around me that she was like super overprotective of on a lot of instances. And looking back at it, I, while I was in it, I probably hated it more than I did like it. But now I'm like, oh, my gosh, like my mother... She looks so wise now, <laughs> and she, she had to do what she had to do, so she kept me from a lot of that, a lot of that, and I also talked about some friends of mine that are dead and in jail, and that's just kind of the fate that a lot of my friends took. Walking to one guy, Travion Williams, walking to the story, return a video, he got shot. Um, my friend earlier that I mentioned uh, just got out of federal prison for running drugs like Nino Brown in New Jack City up in Washington State. Um, yeah, the list goes on and on and on. We could talk more about that extensively, extensively. But because of those experiences, I learned kind of what to do and what not to do. And I'm thankful for it. Uh, sir, you had a question. Yeah, the leadership characteristics and the management characteristics that you're talking about and, and, and demonstrating, um, those are the same characteristics that it takes to make a great teacher. That's right. Have you ever considered that? <laughs> you know what? If my mother was here, she'd probably stand up and give you a round of applause. What's that? I said, how many people would take a class from him? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I certainly appreciate that. That's something I could consider, though, for the future. Yes, sir. Well, you served at Airport for 10 years. Yes, sir. So you were a flight officer? I was a pilot. Pilot? Yes. No, you gonna buy me one? I'm gonna tell you this. Uh -huh. Now, right now, the Mega Millions is up to four hundred five million. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. You know, so if you, I put it in You have a lot of YouTube channels. You can probably win if you buy. Okay. I'm asking a question. All right. How many? I don't want to take the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So that's a good question. How many do I own? Now, at Chick-fil-A, there's about 2,200 restaurants. Most of the franchisees at Chick-fil-A own one. There's about 10% of the Chick-fil-A operators that actually own two. And maybe 1% of the operators own three. So the majority of Chick-fil-A franchisees have one restaurant. So you guys look at that and like, oh, what's the big deal? Let me explain. If you see an average McDonald's, and McDonald's will do like one and a half, maybe a good McDonald's will do like $2 million in sales, annual sales, okay? So we got $2 million in McDonald's for the year. Uh, Subway will do like about a million. Um, name some other fast. Burger King will do like 700,000 for the year. When you see a Chick-fil-A restaurant, just one, that Chick-fil-A restaurant does an average of five and a half million. So that's the equivalent of three, probably four different McDonald's put together when you see one Chick-fil-A restaurant. 
So people are like, man, you got 85 employees for one restaurant? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you guys just don't know. Yeah, we do more volume in six days than a lot of our competition does in seven. So the one restaurant keeps me and uh, several other operators pretty busy. All of the ones around here in California are individually owned and operated. Um, so there, you will see a little different culture in each restaurant, but for the most part, they are, they are focused on that one business operation. So I'm in essence, my, my restaurant will do about six million this year. So I'm the CEO of a $6 million company. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. All right, I think I heard one from you. I heard one from you. Did I hear one from you earlier? Okay, what's your question? Mm -hmm. So how, I have it's a two-part question. So how do you define success? Do you consider yourself as a successful person? How do I define success and do I consider myself a successful person? So the second question, part B of that, yes, I consider myself a successful person. In my own eyes, I define success as me being able to do what I enjoy and loving it to the, to the nth degree. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is, don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but judge it by the seeds that you plant. So for me, for me, because not everybody, uh, if I get to plant seeds, then I'm, I'm successful. Yeah, if it's me just getting money and getting a new car, getting a new house, eh, you know, that stuff doesn't live on. There's no U-Hauls behind hearses. So for me, if I get a chance to plant seeds and empower some people to go out and empower other people, to me, that's how I define success. And if you're not doing that in my book, I don't really consider you successful. But we can see success, what we think is success on a lot of levels by money and cars and houses. But, you know, are they really helping people? And some people who have wealth are truly helping people. So I'm not downing wealthy people. But what I'm saying is for you, you have to be the one to make that determination are you living a truly successful life? And that when you close your eyes in death, would you be satisfied? Yeah. Because a lot of people have a lot of regrets right before they pass away. Yes? Uh, were you able to choose a location? Was I able to choose a location? So at Chick-fil-A, they actually have a huge real estate department that does all the research on demographics, traffic count, uh, income. And they are very strategic about where they place restaurants. Yeah, in fact, if you looked at the growth map right now, you'd probably see 50 different restaurants just around Cerritos College right now where they plan to build. It's pretty crazy. So um, I wasn't even planning. Like I said, I was in Nashville when I applied. I wasn't even planning to move back here. But they said, hey, because we left Compton when I was 13 and moved to Long Beach. So they saw in my application that I had spent time in Long Beach. And they're like, we're about to build a freestanding restaurant in Long Beach. Would you consider moving back to open it? I was like, sure. Absolutely. So that's why I have the first standalone in L.A. County that opened up in 2006, my restaurant. So that's kind of how it happened. But, yeah, they had already done all the research for that location. Yes, sir. Did you have any mentors with the I did. I did. Uh, I kind of touched on that earlier with the uh, operators that were in uh, my area in Nashville. I got a chance to really learn a lot from them. I saw their business plans. I saw their numbers. And... Uh, even to this day, there's this operator in, uh, in Nashville, his name's Bill Fender, and I call up Bill to this day and ask him questions. I call him and his wife Karen, my Chick-fil-A parents, because every time I got a question, they're always there for me. So, yeah, I have a, quite a few mentors in the company, but uh, those two really stand out. All right, was there someone over here? I thought I saw a hand. No? Two more. Two more. Okay, yes, sir. I know they say that there's no, like, dumb questions, right? No. Mm -mm. <laughs> uh, but what are some questions that, that you ask your mentors to become the person you are right now? Oh, what are some questions I have asked? I've asked, actually, one of the questions I specifically remember asking was, how do you define success? I asked, what's successful in your eyes to people in the, in the Chick-fil-A company uh, that own their own restaurants when I was trying to get in? How do you determine if you're successful or not. And I got a, all kind of different answers. Some people were like, oh, as long as your family's happy. And some people are like, as long as you're happy. Uh, some people are like, as long as you're making money. So that's one question I did specifically ask. 
Um, another question is, what have I asked mentors? Most of my questions have been just kind of around different tasks that have to be done. My uh, mentor in the Air Force, I always asked him how he became a colonel in the Air Force and uh, what steps did he take. Um, yeah, if, if you guys, trust me on this one, if you find somebody that sounds really intriguing that you'd like to get to know, call them up, text them, email them, and say, hey, can we get together? Can you sit down with me and just, just kind of point me in the right direction? And most people will make time for that. They will. They will. So that's what I remember doing, meeting with people specifically to kind of pick their brains about how they did what they did and why they did what they did. So those are great, great questions. Yes, sir. This is the last one, I believe. Um, or who was it? Two. Okay. All right. So we'll go here first. And who's the last one? Okay. All right. So Chick-fil-A is a, a, a unique company. It's not a traditional franchise where you have to come to the table with like millions of dollars. So the founder of Chick-fil-A, his name is Truett Cathy. He started Chick-fil-A in 1967, so well over 50 years ago. And he always believed in finding great people that he could be in partnership with. So all he's ever required when I was coming through was $5,000 by a potential franchisee. 5,000. That number doubled in 2015 to actually $10,000 now. So if any of you applied, it would be a $10,000 out of your pocket expense. Now they do require 15% every month going forward, which is a super high royalty, but the cost to get in is pretty minimal compared to other uh, traditional franchises. And um, yeah, that's... Well, what's the percentage? What well, <laughs> they take... Every dollar that comes into my restaurant, they take 15%, one five, 15% off the top. So at the end of every month, I have to pay Chick-fil-A a royalty of 15% of my gross sales. Okay. Yeah, most franchises are like anywhere from six to nine. I think I've seen 10 in some franchises, but we do have the volume to kind of cover what we need. And it's been working for years. I mean, everybody wants to be a Chick-fil-A operator. That 15% doesn't really scare a lot of people. Uh, we actually embrace it. We're like, man, take it and keep building the brand and keep making us look good. Yes. All right. So you mentioned that people always saw you different. Mm -hmm. At what point in your life did you begin to believe it or see the difference? And what were some of those differences? People seeing me different. At what point did I really start to believe that? Wow. Man. I will say this, because of the influences in my life, I don't remember a time when I felt inadequate. Um, I've been in situations with people like in my professional career where they can kind of try to make you feel inadequate, but my support system growing up in my neighborhood and in my church and in my family, they always, I, I can't think of a day when I was like, man, I don't think I can do this. Like everybody was, pushing me to just go ahead, go ahead, go further. And I think that's probably why it's in my DNA now to help other people because so many people come from different backgrounds and they've been told like you're stupid or you can't do that or you'll never be that. And I'm here to tell you that you can. You can do whatever you put your mind to. And I never want people to walk away feeling like, oh, I can never do that because I don't know what that feels like necessarily, but I want to ensure that other people get the experience um, of going through life knowing they can do everything. Yeah. <laughs>